Hi, welcome back to Shelf Starters and Happy New Year. Um, we much. are here. Yeah, <laughs> I'm Rosie, by the way, and this is my mum, Kate, if Hi. you're new here. Um, this is our second year of the Norton Anthology Challenge, and we are about to start the 16th century. Yes. Very exciting. Yes. So we have, um, for those of you who maybe are joining new this time, um, we are reading all the way through the Norton Anthology works, which is basically the English canon from Middle Ages up to now. This will probably take us a very, very, very long time. Um, but we managed to do <laughs> Middle Ages last year, and now we're on to a much thicker volume, which is the 16th and early 17th century. Yes, but, but we did whiz through the Middle Ages, Rosie, you've got to say. We, we, we yeah, we got back pretty fast. But I think also because um, it was a much smaller volume. But oh, yeah. I, I, and all the works within are quite succinct, most obviously. Yeah, we don't have much surviving in like no. the way of manuscripts and things like that compared to the 16th century, which is just booming. So and here we have very long works because we have whole plays and, and you know, yeah. so literally. Yeah, that's only cool about the Norton actually is they do include complete works of a lot of things so um yeah not that not that they're sponsoring us I wish they would <laughs> but it's a great way to save money I suppose if you want to just get this whole book then you've got loads of um works already included in there and you don't have to get them separately so anyway um so today we're going to be just talking about an intro to the period basically and then we will also be doing a um a video to explain exactly which works we're going to be covering um over the next little while um so you can have a look at that and if you want to read along um then you know what's coming up and i will also in that video try to put in some links of where you can find the works for free online as well because they are also obviously out of copyright at this point so yes. you can generally find um yeah free free works so it doesn't have to be a expensive thing all right so 16th century i think this is my favorite period of history actually in england well, it's certainly a juicy period of your history, isn't it? You yeah, could, there's you a could lot describe going it on. as dull, put it that way. <laughs> Not a great phenomenal, period to live. Phenomenal but... change going on in, in every sector. Yeah. Starting, yeah. With, starting with the church and working its way through, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you want to explain who's actually in power at this point? So we've got, um, well, we end with Elizabeth I, don't we? So we start with... Henry the seventh and mm -hmm. then from there we go to Henry the eighth and of course that's where all the shenanigans all the drama happens. happens yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. all <laughs> the shenanigans start with Henry the eighth and that pretty much takes us most of that that era right from yeah. 1509 was his ascension to the throne and then that went through to 1558 Eight was when we got Elizabeth the first. Wow, good memory. So that's <laughs> that's a long period of time, obviously. And yeah, it's most of the 16th century. Happened. It's basically the 16th century, and and essentially, <laughs> yep, all the big changes and you know treason and juicy acts occurred then, including yeah. not and notwithstanding the entire creation of the Church of England. Oh yeah, that's the big thing. Fair but the, the um, what you're saying about the treason and all of that sort of stuff, I think that's the really interesting part. Is all the, like the um, culture of deception and everyone trying to like cover up what they're really thinking, and everyone having basically masks on, I suppose. Yes. Um, and learning to like they said, even in the language, people spoke in double entendre and stuff. So it's like you're really masking what you really feel all so <laughs> the it's, time. It's a world of doubling. Mm. a time of, of doubling and buying and yeah all this intrigue yeah. it's an undercurrent yeah. all the time and what mm. and having to literally watch your back yeah. so <laughs> it is a really kind of exciting tense time and mm -hmm. then you go along so along with all of that we have huge developments in terms of literature yes and we have the building of the first theatre in London also yeah so we have the first a theater. place to um, house actual plays rather than yes yeah, so they um yes we, we saw in the in the middle ages that they had um yeah these like more traveling traveling things, I guess. yeah and they, yeah they like we had the york plays that where they do it just in the like th all throughout the town and, and they're going along on their wagons and things like that that was very much how theater was done until yeah, and now yeah. we've got a permanent house where pe people can go 
and people of all classes did go and you know and then we have the birth of Shakespearean theatre. Shakespeare and Marlowe and all of that which we yeah we're very excited to get to eventually. Yes. yes. Um, another big thing in in literature as well was um, re- the change of reading so reading used to be a very private a uh, yes. very public thing rather um, where yeah. you you read aloud and it was like it was something that people did together as a social thing and then it became a private thing where yeah. um literally silent reading became a thing for the first time yes, yes I, that, was, that was, was very interesting to read about that to think to even just think about that actually I want to um break in here and say uh if you're interested in like how cha- things have changed in reading and just the history of reading in general, mm-hmm. there's a great book um, written by my old Oxford tutor actually mm-hmm. um, called The Woman Reader. It's by Belinda Jack. I have it. I'll show you again another time. I suppose it's, it's in another, another bookshelf, but yeah. it's really interesting. And it goes into all those changes about like who could read, um, what society kind of like meant for reading um, and especially for women and how that changed over time. Um, and yeah, the transition from it being a social thing to a private thing, yeah. how it links to religion, all sorts of things like that. It's very, very interesting. Absolutely. Not. I, I must actually read that myself. I haven't read that. Haven't <laughs> it's read good. It's very good. Yeah. Um, and yeah, then you're supporting my tutor, which I love. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and also we had the printing press, which came in. I was going to say the printing uh, press, which thing. then made another big, diff- big difference. But of course, but, you had to learn to read. Yeah, people had to learn to read and it wasn't, um, that's where it also links into to the religion thing as well because um, Bibles were in Latin in you know the traditional sense for, for Catholicism and then there was a whole movement to can we get the Bible translated into English, which is going to be something that is very much focused on in the Norton Anthology, so that would be cool to see. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I guess people start learning how to read in English. Yes. Um, and the other thing is that I think, uh, like, poets and authors and um, playwrights and everything at the time had no copyright no. so that's another interesting fact is that they had to um they had to have a like patron yes. to support them because the actual act of selling their work was they basically got nothing for that really that's they had right. to sell it directly to the printer or to the actual bookseller um rather than like this concept of selling the rights which and having advances and all that like we have <laughs> these days um so they got actually like Barely and that's where we always hear about Shakespeare and his um, being his patron was in fact the Queen. Yeah, which is a huge deal. Um, Massive because it affects everything he writes. <laughs> He's got it also means it's still your work. So yes, like, oh, yeah, it does. Like, it yeah, does. you don't really, you don't have a really strong patron um, promoting your work, then your work will be stolen <laughs> probably by someone else, and they will be better at um, you know advertising it and talking about it and getting it seen and heard and everything so yeah having a a good patron was a very very big deal and they apparently another um cool fact that I got from the from the intro was apparently because that was such a big thing that you had to find a good patron people often um put in like insertable uh dedication pages into their books so they would dedicate their work to multiple different people without them knowing right so each patron thought that they were like the sole patron of this person (laughs) <laughs> but actually they've they've sort of hedged their bets and taken it to many many different people so that they can get more support I suppose um which is kind of funny so yeah and actual books as well where like little um were the quartos quartos yeah quartos yeah like folded paper basically yeah, yeah. I think it's <laughs> little for works a quarter mm. yeah very cool yeah. anyway should we get into the um religion stuff because that is that's yes. a big yes. topic Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we've obviously got um, the rise or the um, movement towards the Church of England taking place. So prior to that, the whole, well, the whole of Europe is Catholic, but England is always separate from the rest of Europe and was very, very separate back back in the 16th century. So we've got this kind of um, Catholicism in Europe. And then we've got the problem that Henry VIII um, wants to force Catholic. Well, yes, because so we've got the also the issue of monarchy and monarchy existing on male heirs and being mm-hmm. able to hand your throne the throne down. And Henry VIII keeps having troubles here. So his solution is to actually just dispose of 
wives who cannot pr produce said heirs. <laughs> and, Again, with Catherine, and it's the whole thing with Anne Boleyn is the, the big change, the big shift. Yes. So he starts out, yes, exactly. So he, he realises that he needs to actually shed wives and um, short of just killing them all, the next solution is, is actually being able to divorce them. <laughs> but yeah. um, under the Catholic Church, of course, you can't remarry. Mm -hmm. So he needs a church that will support the notion of him being able to remarry. And hence, the Church of England is, is in fact born. Protestantism is born. And that, of course, influences everything everything to do not with the monarchy and with literature and yeah. I think that's and that is really the basis for the whole of everything that went on in the 16th century more or less yeah and it was I think it's the whole dangerous time to be alive because really no matter what yeah. religion you were it was so unstable because it kept they kept changing the religion that the monarchy followed basically yes. so <laughs> no matter which religion you declared yourself because to be because at the same before. time you had the rise of humanism that was taking place mm -hmm. in Germany, in Wittenberg, wasn't it? That's Germany, I think. Yeah. Yes, that's, I'm right. So humanism is still Christian, but yeah. it's a, a shift in gear. So whereas um, feudal Christian Christianity was all about, you know, God and um, uh, everything sorted, all your, you know, man having very little control over his own life, mm -hmm. everything was preordained. Um, and then humanism came along and said, actually, we're really interested in man as, the, as a focus and the um, agency of the individual. We're not saying, yeah. we, but the rest of Christianity remains intact, but we're questioning yeah. the role of the individual. And we think there's more agency associated with the individual than... Yeah, less like reliance on like fate and things like that. It was yeah. more, yeah. yeah. So this is a choice. huge, huge question mark, you know, uh, uh, and really interesting, obviously, for everybody, you know, a fascinating idea, but it also means, wow, you've got to not just reassess your thoughts in terms of Christianity and your thoughts perhaps in terms of church, but it actually underpins the whole of society, the whole of social structure. So yeah. that's a seismic shift as well. So we've got um, the church influencing social structure and then at the same time as all of this going on, because we've got this, it's called Renaissance humanism, and you, there is a look back to classical literature, and there is, a, or the classics, just the classics, there's also um, great movement and development going on in terms of um, exploration and um, the idea of England forging new ground, finding new lands. <laughs> thing being England as an identity which wasn't so much of a thing yes until now yes so you've got all of these shifts going on at the same time so mm -hmm. it's kind of like a perfect storm for literally a very explosive time in history and that yeah. has a, a monumental effect on literature yeah yeah so that's, that's correct in, um, in education as well because like you yes. said we went back to the classics Yes. Um, and apparently they used to only really teach Latin, but now they started going back to teaching ancient Greek as well. Yeah. Um, and, of course, women were not really taught much, but they, they did have some education in, like, modern languages, household things, <laughs> that sort of yes. thing. Um, and universities expanded in their scope as well. So and we had, I think we had the University of Oxford and maybe Cambridge at that time. Yeah. Yes. Um, but it was like, it used to be just that you went to university to become some part of the church. That's like right. You were training thing. for a, a career in, within the yeah. church. And, and now it's expected not. It was, I think, church or law. And those, those were the only options yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And now it's expected to like anything to do with like household management, any kind of like business, I suppose. <laughs> it expanded to just learning how to do business, yeah. um, which is interesting. So yeah, everything is broadening. Um, and then, yeah, when you were talking about the the shift to a more of an English identity as well, what yes. I thought was interesting because they hadn't really had that before, they didn't really know what to consider themselves as, I suppose. Um, they saw themselves more in the sense of what they were not. So yes. it was more like othering <laughs> rather than 
knowing what they were proud of and things it was more like what they didn't want to be Breathing. um yes which is it's very interesting at the time because there were a lot of like um migrants and things at that time that were just like not really documented or kept track of when they <laughs> um and I suppose that yeah that's interesting that they that they kind of made it seem like they didn't they weren't there but they were yeah um and seeing how they were they were treated at the time as well so we have like uh, a lot of Jews in London at the time yes we have a small African population as well um and then of course there's a whole issue of like slavery and whether or not that was a thing in England yes. because I think it was never actually legal but it definitely did happen absolutely um, and these are all the issues that Shakespeare actually right really explored yeah yeah so you know he, he had it all didn't he the Merchant of Venice um that yeah, sure. where he looks at the idea of slavery so mm. he yeah all he, and then of course all the history plays so he was busily taking this time and looking at these there's key so key. much you can see why he wrote so many amazing plays because there was so much, so much going on yeah. 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 yeah that's right um yeah. and then going back to uh so we've got we've had henry the eighth yep very top of the there. he's been yep. killing all his wives etc killing yeah. them all you know uh, divorcing them all that um and then we get to mary yes mary bloody mary yeah who yeah. brings it back to catholicism yes and burns people at the stake yes i yeah horrific horrific like a lot of them i think what was the number i think it was like 300 she burnt almost 300 protestants at the stake yeah. And so it's interesting um, because we always one day, of actually the worst one being Henry VIII and we don't. Yeah, but he didn't kill as many people. No. He killed quite a few people. But yeah. also it was, it was more he did the behaviour. The way he did it. He did that undrawn and courted behaviour, which is fairly nasty. And But burning at the stake is pretty bad. I think that's like, that's going to be one of the worst. Oh, I don't know. The whole period was bad for torture. I don't know. I think being gutted <laughs> from the head to toe and, and yes. sung up and then gutted. It's fairly bad. Not the best. Not but best. anyway, we digress. Go on. But yeah, so then, then Mary came along. She was extra brutal. She died and it went back to Elizabeth, who then switched back <laughs> to Protestantism. That's right. And, mm. and, she, and she, of course, was there for a, for a very long time. Yes, and had no children. Or... And had no children. So the problem just carried on. The air problem just kept on going. But then we have... The Stuart kings come in because you get James the first. Yeah, the they get James the first, and then that's kind of where we end with the 16th century, at least at this point. But the thing that I think is really cool is how women were seen in that period under Elizabeth, because of course she's this female in power, and they they obviously don't think that fem- that women should rule over men. That's a very like big thing at that time period. So they're like, how do we get past this? Now we have a, a natural queen. How do we like? I guess reconcile that well, we idea just, that we and we just um, go between we just oscillate between her being very much a woman and making the most of her jewels and her you know her finery and her femininity and being you know having portraits done that way and you and using that to pretending she's a man and wearing armor and you know sitting on a sword with a horse so she kind of did the whole jewel yeah, I love that image of her in the actual armor, like going in. So that was when um, there was the Spanish Armada. Yeah. And um, which I like, I knew about, but I don't think I've actually like paid much attention to it. So it all got defeated by the weather, which is very English. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Darn, it's raining. We can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> that was very lucky for them. Um, We're not they, thought for them. Be, they thought there'd be a land attack as well. So they were all preparing for this big battle. And Elizabeth comes out in full like armor uh-huh. and does this really great um speech to the soldiers, which I think was so cool. Well, so she, she was, was like nothing if not a show person. I mean, she understood mm-hmm. the show. She yeah, did. Really yeah. Did. She, she was like a very personal PR machine. She absolutely definitely got. and she fostered this. What I thought was really cool is the way that they explained this in the um in the Norton was a cult of love. Yeah. So she yeah. she made people love her. Yeah. And was very much into like favoring people, and but then also like getting people jealous of yeah her attention. So yes. she'd play yes. people off against each other. That's right. She um, did that a lot. 
And, and she was very cruel to anyone who didn't kind of seem to toe the line or show some, or who in fact tried to show interest in anybody else. She basically yeah. cut them off at the knees fairly quickly. Well, yeah, even even the guy that was supposedly possibly her lover. When Walter, he, he was that Walter Rally, you mean? The guy at the end, I don't know. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know who he was. So there were him. several, apparently. Like um, it's towards the end of her reign where she um she found out that he was actually like conspiring against her yes, and, and got yes. him, which was very sad that that's someone like that she obviously trusted at the time. Yeah. And then okay. yeah. Um but yeah, I thought that was um the cult of love was very interesting because it's that flowery language that you also see come out in literature where everyone's like talking about love all the time and it's very much like at the forefront. And you, you see that in like sonnets and things of the time that it was, it just suddenly became very like full of imagery and things like that which you you had obviously a little bit of imagery in the middle ages but it was much yeah. more straightforward language and now we've got into metaphors <laughs> and all of that which you yes. yeah you didn't really see before and so it's a very big influence on the art and literature of the time absolutely absolutely mm-hmm. and then you have the two main sort of ones we really all know about Marlowe and and Shakespeare they're the ones we really know about oh but then we've got Scott and the Fairy Queen and don't we Oh, there's loads, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm thinking yeah. in terms of mainstream that people, you know, that we all talk about in every day, you know, and, and the not. Main, main writers that we're. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think, um, yeah, so it's, it's Edward Spencer who did the, the Fairy Queen. Yes. Um, and have, yeah, uh, John Dunn. Um, Dunn, we all know for sure. Shakespeare, Marlowe. Yeah. Um, but I was actually surprised at how, like, few writers from this time I actually knew. So I'm really yes, excited to... because I think because the attention... It's I on Shakespeare. It, it, yeah, and that's <laughs> because he was so prolific, partly, mm. I suppose, and very yeah. accessible to everybody as well. And public, yeah. public instead of private, I suppose, too. Because it's, yeah. yeah, I think... Um, uh, yeah, maybe it's also how much is surviving. I think it's a prolific thing that is a, a big deal for sure. I yeah. think the interesting thing that um that I I guess I haven't thought about. It's not necessarily that I like didn't know it. I just never really came to me was um that a lot of the writers from this time were actually in the court. Yes. So you get people yes. who were like rubbing up against the the royals sometimes literally. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> um and yeah writing poetry and things at the same time and they didn't see it as a career in that sense it was more like a hobby that they had Mm. so part of being a good like courtier was also being good at poetry (laughs) things like that um so yeah it's a really just a really interesting time period with a lot of a lot of great works to get into yes yes i'm very including the bible itself yes which i am reading the um king james bible I am slowly progressing through it from cover to cover, um, which I've never, never done before because I am not religious. So this is like my first time you properly would. reading it. And it is very interesting. Yeah. So obviously, keen to see that's obviously like the you know, King James very Yes. Um, yes, yes. But I get to see all the how the, like the other variations that come up in here because I think there's a lot of like there's the Book of Common Prayer as well that is written in this time. Um, and yeah, a lot of discussion about making religion more accessible, basically. Yeah. Oh, so. and of course, we've got Milton as well. Paradise. That's way towards the very end. But yeah, yeah. I, I'd forgotten about Milton being. I think Milton might even be early 17th century. Yeah, he must be because that I don't think of him as part of this era, I've got to say. I think it's early 17th, but yeah, it's all coming up to that point. So I think yeah. there'll be a lot of great authors to dive into in this yeah. period. Yeah. Very exciting. Yes. Yeah. It's going um, to be great. I'm looking forward to it. And, great, yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're going to be kicking off with, are, are we going to talk about what we're kicking off with? Well, we will, yeah, we can talk about what we're kicking off with, but then we will do a full video, like, explaining yeah. okay. everyone that's up. But we will be kicking off with John Skelton. Yes. Um, who I've never heard of before, but he created Skeltonics, which is, like, his way of doing rhyming and things like that. So yep. um, to be interesting. So yeah, a lot of poetry in this um, period, which I guess is kind of good because it means it's you know very short chunks of things that you can jump into. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, from there going into utopia and some more like yes. philosophical things. Philosophical well. work. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, hope that you're excited to join us possibly on this very long. <laughs> um, I think it's going to be really, really exciting stuff. I think it'll be really. 
it's going to be fun, a lot of fun, because it's really lovely to have um, that kind of new and un previously perhaps unheard of mixed with very familiar. So yeah, that's going to make it, that's going to be, I mean, who doesn't know, uh, you know, about Shakespeare and who doesn't know <laughs> about Queen Elizabeth and, and Henry? Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of that kind of old familiar comfort area, but learning new things and seeing it in a new light, which is, yeah, going, yeah. I think, will be great fun. For sure. Yeah. I can't wait. Me neither. So um, really let us know uh, very, like, if you have a specific author or poet or playwright or whatever um that you're excited for us to get to in this period um yeah and we're really looking forward to getting started yeah fantastic rosie well Thanks, we should start reading start reading our yeah. tome Look, quite, <laughs> quite a thick tome so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get a lot of love I'm sure plenty ahead All right. <laughs> yeah yeah well right, thanks for watching everyone it. and see you again next time See you Bye. next time. Bye, everyone.